недвижок, но если будет задержка, как только они скажут. Mm-hmm. All right, dear colleagues, welcome to our conference. What is English coaching and what isn't? Uh, We still have some time before the start and I'd like to use this opportunity to get to know each other. My name is Kirill and I am Chief Business Development Officer at SkyS, digital platform for teaching English. Language coaching is a relatively new phenomenon in the AFL world and as such raises interest among experts in teaching. It appears that educators sometimes attach different meanings to the term. So what is language coaching? Today, we will try to find answers to this and other questions together with leading methodologists and education professionals from around the world. Uh, Let me introduce them. Uh, Dr. Ron Marain, Dr. Crystal Schneider Brody, Dr. Christine Kuhn, Heather Hansen, Andre Hedlund, Dr. Svetlana Titova, and Alexei Konabeev. We will have a good time and at the end of the conference, all of our viewers will be able to get the certificate of participation and a free one month access to SkyS English teaching platform for higher education institutions. So while we still have time, let me tell you a few words about the organizer of this conference, SkyS. SkyS is a net tech company that provides digital solutions for teaching English in universities and colleges. Our service helps to save teachers time up to 90 hours per semester and increase the academic performance of students. We are widely represented in Eastern Europe and CIS countries with over 250 universities using our platform. With uh, SkyS, you're able to enjoy 24 seven access to online textbooks, interactive courses, tests, and multimedia for teachers' professional development and the academic growth of students. Besides general English, we have a variety of courses like English for marketing, English for IT, business writing, and of course, self-study courses for ESL exams. So to sum it all up, SkyS saves you time. You no longer have to waste your time on inputting the materials manually like uh, um, in learning management systems. Uh, SkyS already has all the necessary materials for every level on the platform. Now teachers can focus on what is really important, the students. Not only that, you can download academic reports of all your groups for a semester or even for the whole academic year with one click. And the platform checks homework automatically. SkyS increases academic performance. In addition to the main program, students have 24 seven access to extra courses for self-study and development. SkyS has uh, Lego grammar, video practice lessons, vocabulary trainers, and many others. We also successfully implemented gamification process into the study. Students will now receive um, different achievements like in mobile games for being the first to complete their homework or for receiving the high score or completing three homeworks in a row without making a single mistake. It brings a spirit of uh, healthy competition and motivates students to improve their skills while adding an element of entertainment to classes. SkyS is also affordable and we are an international company operating in several countries and Of course, we are doing our best to make education affordable. That is why we do not charge per course. Our platform is access-based. And what that means is once you have an access to the platform, you have an access to all the materials with no extra or hidden fees. So let me show you a video introduction so you could see for yourselves how the platform works. Okay. And share sound. Here we go. Welcome to Skies Digital for Higher Ed. In this video, we'll tell you what Skies Digital is and for what purposes you can use its services. Skies Digital is an online platform for teaching English in higher institutions. Wherever you are, everything you need for teaching is already in your computer, your personal area, list of all groups and students, educational courses for teaching English for different levels and purposes, for internships, job interviews, IT, management and much more. 
library of video resources and interactive tasks. All tasks are done on the platform. All you need is just a laptop, a tablet or a smartphone with internet connection. The platform checks the work of each student and of a group as a whole. All tasks are checked automatically and you can see results immediately. You can monitor students' progress in your personal area. Points for completed tasks. Mistakes made. Dynamics of language skills. Based on these data, you can develop an individual learning plan for each student. Use Sky's digital services and your students will definitely reach their goals. Sincerely yours, Sky's digital team. Okay, wonderful. Um, I remind you that all of the participants will be able to enjoy one month access to all the materials on our platform on Sky as digital platform. So please stick with us to the end. And I believe we still have about six to seven minutes. So get ready, get your coffee, get your tea. We are starting soon.
Uh, greetings, everybody. We are going to start our conference. First of all, I'd like to apologize to those who got confused uh, by the difference between Greenwich Mean Time and London Time. It turns out that there is one, uh, one hour difference, so it's not the same. But this was a socio cultural moment for all of us to learn. And I'd like to greet you. My name is Alexei Konobiev. I work as academic director uh, at SkyS for Universities platform and uh, at uh, Sky, uh, Skying School, which is the largest online school in Eastern Europe. Uh, we are going to start our conference and, uh, I, uh, and we are going to meet our panelists, first of all, uh, and uh, let us introduce uh, ourselves. So I'd like to start with Dr. Ron Marine. Hello, everyone. I'm Ron Marine, um, and I work for Syntax Solutions in the Netherlands. I'm an uh, educational consultant. Uh, we consult uh, universities uh, and middle to uh, large size companies to plan and uh, restructure their training plans for language. I'm also a lecturing professor at the University of Duisburg Essen, uh, where I work in the personnel department and responsible for the planning, implementation, and assessment for staff development. Okay, thank you, Ron. Now on to Christine Kuhn. Hi, my name is Christine Combe, and I've been based in the United Arab Emirates for the past 28 years, where I'm an associate professor of general studies and English communications at Dubai Men's College, which is one of 18 higher colleges of technology. I've been heavily involved in association leadership, having been served as president of TESOL Arabia. <laughs> Uh, the third uh, largest te English language teaching association in the world. And uh, most recently, I served as TESOL International President from 2010 to 2013. My areas of specialization include uh, language assessment. I've written and published books in areas on it, like assessment, task-based teaching and learning, leadership, research methods, Etc. I'm happy to be here. I'm currently on vacation in the U.S. So, but most of the year I'm in Dubai. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Thank you very much, Christine. And now on to Heather Hansen. Hi, everyone. So nice to be here. I'm Heather Hansen. I'm based in Singapore. I run an English language consultancy and training firm called Global Speech Academy. I've been doing this since 2007 here in Singapore and also in Denmark. Um, I work primarily with multinational companies using English as their corporate language to help their top leaders speak up clearly and confidently. I have a lot of focus on presentation skills, articulation, people skills, uh, and general communication. So very happy to be here and uh, talk about this interesting subject tonight. Uh, thank you very much, Heather. And now on to Andrew Headland. Hello everyone, such a pleasure to be here. I'm coming from Brazil in the Midwestern region where it's always hot and I'm achieving alumnus with a master's degree in, in psychology of education from the University of Bristol. I currently work as a bilingual program mentor, which means that I help implement bilingual solutions in private schools here in Brazil. I'm also a guest lecturer at some universities. I'm teaching currently bilingualism and global education. I'm a consultant. I do some revision. Well, I do many things and I'm really honored to be here today with you talking about such an important subject. Thank you very much, Andre. And now on to Svetlana Titova. Ah, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm based in Moscow. I work at the biggest university uh, of Russia. Moscow State Lomonosov University uh, at the School of uh, Foreign Languages and Area Studies. I'm a professor at uh, the Department of Foreign Language Methodologies. I have more than 30 years experience in teaching and teacher training, uh, publishing in foreign language education. Uh, I'm a material writer and tutor of online PD and CPD courses developed specifically for language teachers uh, to promote their ICT skills in uh, their teaching process. Um, so uh, my research interests uh, include blended mobile learning, distant learning, 
remote learning. So everything what is connected with ICT. Uh, I'm also a coordinator of uh, the online project, uh, Learn, Teach Web, Learning and Teaching with the Web, aimed at facilitating uh, the process of implementing of uh, different kinds of digital uh, apps and uh, mobile technologies into language classroom. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now on to uh, Crystal Brody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, thank you for having me today. I'm speaking to you from Lexington, Kentucky in the USA. Uh, I'm originally from Germany and uh, I'm, I've been living here for a long time. I am a professor <clears throat> at a, a US institution for, I work in teacher training there. I'm also a specialist for the US Department of State where I do missions all over the world, working in training um, to other countries. Um, like Christine, who is my dear friend and colleague, I'm also an association leader at TESOL. I was, um, you know, affiliate president uh, in the U.S. and now, now um, my last assignment was as a board of director for TESO International. I'm also a um, international keynote speaker and author, not as much an author as Christine because she's the world champion of publishing. Um, and my special areas are um, since 1998 digital language instruction, one of the earlier people working on it. Um, international teacher training, degree programs, um, brain-based learning is my lens. I taught German as a foreign and second language, French as a foreign language, and English as a foreign language, ESP, ELT, any facet of English as a second language, ELT. And I'm delighted to be here with all of these wonderful professionals. I feel honored. Uh, thank you very much, Crystal. Uh, I see that we are, uh, we are joined by more and more viewers, and I'd like uh, all of you present, all of, uh, all of you who are joining us, could you please write in the chat what countries you are watching us from? And I was, uh, I was just going to remind you that all our viewers are going to get certificates, electronic certificates of participation, and my colleague Kirill, after the conference is over, in the end, will tell you how to get them. And if you'd like to ask our panelists, our great speakers, any questions, feel free to do so. I will take them from the chat, and our, uh, our speakers are also present in the chat, so I will make sure that everybody gets the question. And if you'd like to ask a particular speaker any particular questions, feel free to mentioned who this question is addressed to. And without further ado, and without uh, waiting any longer, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to give word to uh, Ron Marine because we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about uh, so many things that people have been talking about, have been thinking about. And uh, Ron, you have worked with teachers on many levels for over 30 years now, and as a university professor, I'm sure you believe that teaching should be based on methodology supported by research, as, we, uh, as most of us do, and language coaching is a very popular term, but it seems that different specialists have different understanding of what language coaching is. For example, when we announced this conference, we got a comment from a teacher that language coaching is about doing less and getting paid more. Getting paid more is, very uh, is a very fine thing, and I'm sure that all of us would love to be get paid more, no matter what our current salaries are. But this is clearly not a very scientific description. Can you please tell us about your experience of language coaching with methodology and the research about language coaching? Uh Again, I would like to thank everybody for being here today. I feel so honored to be with such a great group of people today uh, and would like to thank Skies University for sponsoring this. I would like to move uh, very quickly to a short presentation that I prepared uh, as a springboard for all of us uh, to have a little bit of discussion, okay? Uh, and so I'm just gonna share my screen now. Uh, and uh, if I could just get that to there we go okay uh and we should go there and there we are okay uh and very quickly again welcome to what is language coaching and what it isn't okay uh and i would like to start by saying if we want to improve a skill 
we need to know what exactly has to change and what might get us there. Now, um, we've heard so much in the last few years about what language coaching is, and we hear so much uh, things, we see a lot of things on the internet uh, about upgrading, upscaling, rebranding, uh, take this uh, language coaching uh, seminar or webinar, uh, and you can get a certification uh, to be a, a language coach and you can get more money, as you said, Alexi. But is that really what it is? I, I would like to start by just saying what I feel. And again, this is my opinion about what language coaching is not. And I would like to start with what it's not. And I would first like to say that language coaching is not life coaching. They are not related in any way whatsoever. They do not overlap in any way whatsoever. They do not use the same principles uh, and they do not use the same methods uh, and they do not have the same goals. Now that's just one thing that I would like to start with about what language coaching is not. I also would like to add that language coaching is not a new trend. It's been around for a long time. We just probably called it something else. And would also like to add uh, that we probably as teachers have integrated the concept of language coaching into our teaching practice. Uh, but I also would like to say, and I am a true believer in this, that uh, you know, an experienced teacher uh, knows that, that language coaching is not teaching. Uh, language coaching is not training because that has already happened before the language coaching process starts. Uh, language coaching is not a magical framework. Uh, it's not something that somebody created uh, and is selling. It's been there all along. Uh, and I will give some references of where that actually comes from. Language coaching is not a one fits all formula because our learners are individuals and come to the table with different needs. Uh, and we as teachers or trainers or coaches want to help our learners to meet those needs. Uh, there is actually a framework that language coaches can use to make that job a little bit easier as a language coach. Uh, and I would like to say that language coaching is not a guarded state secret. It's been around for a long time, as I've already said, uh, but we might not have called it that. Uh, it's not a registered trademark. There is no one in the language industry who owns the name language coaching. It is not a protected uh, brand. Uh, and uh, that has to be said because again, we probably as teachers are already doing language coaching. Uh, language coaching is not a registered foundation. There is no international group, organization, or company that uh, um, has a right to the term language coaching. And language coaching is not rocket science. Again, we probably have been doing it all along and have just been calling it something different. But what is language coaching? And I would like to put that into simple terms. Language coaching, again, has been around for a long time and as around for as long as language learning has been around. Uh, there are certain principles that separate language learning, language training, and language coaching from one another. There are five points, I believe, that really separate uh, the language coaching process from language learning and language training. Those five points are performance. And when I say performance, I mean PBL in the sense of performance-based learning. This is why it's important for teachers who are doing language coaching to be aware of their methodologies, because it is important to know what performance-based learning is and how we integrate that and how that is a leading methodology in language coaching. But there are other things that happen in language coaching, and that is assessment, feedback, improvement, and repetition. Let's move on to just kind of condense this one more time. You probably have been doing language coaching all along as part of your teaching practice, but just didn't call it that. If you're doing performance, assessment, feedback loops, improvement, and repetition, then you're doing language coaching. 
but who is a language coach? Well, you know, that was one of the questions that just absolutely drove me crazy. And I had to do a lot of research to try to find that answer. Although I have considered myself a language coach for over 25 years and have been doing language coaching uh, as part of my corporate training and have integrated that into how I teach and train students and staff at universities, uh, there is something that language coaches have that maybe other language teachers and trainers don't have. And again, that is, how do we know? Well, as an owner of schools, I'm able to see that because it's written there in your CV. How do I know who a language coach is? Your CV is going to tell me everything because it will show me how far you are in your teacher development because language coaches do have certain skills uh, and experience cannot be circumnavigated. We're able to see that. And I would just like to say before I talk about those skills that language coaches bring to the table, I use good references and have used them for many years as to what really is teacher, how far a teacher is, what is a trainer, how far a trainer is, and what a coach is. And here you see that I use the equals framework for language teacher training and development, which is a downloadable PDF that everyone has access for free to look at that. And I ask teachers to really download that. It's available in nine languages. Uh, and you can see and reflect on where you're at in your CPD journey and ask the question to yourself, are you a language coach? Uh, because your CV will tell you that. But I also ask teachers to download the PDF uh, of the Alta European Language Portfolio because I believe that language coaching is about assessment. Uh, and we, if we're going to be doing assessment, we need some criteria, can do statements uh, that are offered here to you for free uh, from Equals. Again, one more time, a downloadable PDF of the Alta uh, language portfolio that teachers need to be able to do and successfully do language coaching. Uh, well, what skills does a language coach bring to the table to perform their role effectively? Again, this is not something I've made up. I researched this very carefully and have actually come to the conclusion that this is what separates a language coach from a language teacher. This list comes from equals uh, and is something that I just put together and condensed. I believe that a, an effective language coach does have a C1 plus to C2 language level that they uh, in the target language. Let us not forget that language coaching is not something that just happens in English. I speak fluent German and Spanish and can also do coaching in that language as well. Uh, knowledge of language mechanics for communication purposes is something that an experienced seasoned teacher brings to the table already, but is something that is necessary for a language coach to have. They also have a highly developed communication skills in the target language, especially in the skills of speaking and writing. Uh, they do have a good foundation, knowledge of assessment uh, and experience in assessment, because again, language coach, coaching depends heavily on knowing how to assess. They also have very good feedback skills and strategies. Uh, they are very aware of their methodologies, especially task-based learning and performance-based learning. They also have an understanding of instructional design because they will be required to design some coaching uh, events, uh, coaching sessions. So they need to understand how to put those together. I will show you a simple framework that you can use. They are very good at time management. I myself do not allow any language coaching session to go for more than 45 minutes because of the stress that it can put students, learners, or participants under. I will explain that later. They also have good technology skills. They're very technology savvy. Uh, they're very digital literate, 
especially in the coaching context. I say that because I no longer do face-to-face -face, uh, coaching. Most of it does happen online. Uh, and corporations know that they are not willing to pay for coaching face-to-face -face anymore when they know that they can get it online. I think that good language coaches bring the skill of storyboarding uh, to the table because they are going to be required to help their uh, coaches put things together uh, in a maybe more logical way. So storyboarding is a skill I believe that good coaches bring to the table. They also bring an awareness of different learning environments uh, and context to the table, uh, academic learning environments, university, uh, maybe uh, uh, vocational schools, technical colleges, uh, but they also understand the corporate training realm uh, and what happens there because there is a difference between how language coaching uh, works in the corporate uh, environment as compared to the academic environment. Uh, and also, I would like to say that I think good coaches bring an awareness of what best practices are and lessons learned in a teaching, training, and coaching context. They know what works, and they also know what doesn't work. Well, let's talk about the coachee. Who are these people who come to these sessions and want language coaching? Uh, now, I'm going to approach this in a totally different way because I would like to just say this is a profile that I put together after many years of doing language coaching in the academic and corporate learning environments. And I believe that it's not possible for someone to come to a language coaching session without a pre-knowledge level of at least B1+, plus, because language coaching is not about teaching and not about training. They've got to come with a, a good language level to be able to really feel a sense of efficacy uh, at the end of that language coaching. They are self-directed and self-motivated and to a high degree, uh, you know, there uh, and there are some exceptions to that rule, but someone who wants language coaching knows what they want. They do have a goal. Uh, they usually are operating under some time constraint and there's a sense of urgency. They know they might be going to a conference where they're going to have to be giving a presentation. Uh, and that usually is one of the most, uh, 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 one of the things that is mostly done in, in a language coaching session where someone knows they're going to be going to a conference in 30 days or maybe two months and they want to really prepare for that. Uh, they, uh, students, uh, my PhD students know that they will have to make presentations at conferences and they also want to prepare for those as well too. Uh, they are um, goal oriented and they do have a target. They, like I said, they know what they want. Uh, they're ready for some feedback on their performance. They know what's going to happen, but I do have a framework that I show them just to remind them of how that coaching session is going to be organized. I'll show that to you next. Uh, and they're ready to invest that time for their self-improvement because this is something that's part of their goal and they know that it's going to take some time. They're willing to listen to advice, suggestions, and recommendations. And yes, language coaches do give advice, suggestions, and recommendations uh, for their coaches to improve. That is that one point that separates life coaching from language coaching. Uh, and they're willing to go back to the drawing board to rethink and reflect about their uh, performance because they know that they will have to move to the point of purposefully practice and, and change that. Uh, and of course, this is important uh, that they understand that just one performance uh, is not enough for them to feel good about themselves after the assessment, after the feedback, they will go back and rethink everything, improve it and start the cycle one more time. Uh, they're willing to repeat that process because that process can be monotonous, but they realize that it's necessary for their self-improvement. Uh, and they're able to deal with the ups and downs of the coaching process with some support from their coach. Uh, and they're able to develop uh, themselves uh, 
through the coaching process uh, and build that sense of self-confidence that they need uh, to perform that task or that presentation that they will be doing uh, at a, um, a conference in the future. And they get this confidence by going through that language coaching process again and again. Well, this is one of the frameworks that I use here uh, to, let me just, Okay, it's sort of stuck there, okay, but, um, oops, uh, excuse me, it's sort of mixing up here a little bit, okay, uh, that's one frame too far. This is the framework that I show uh, the, the uh, people who I will be coaching. Uh, I show them this framework and explain to them how that's going to work. Again, I talked about being focused on a goal. They have a goal uh, that they will perform. Uh, there will be assessment with immediate feedback and there will also be that reflection, improvement, and repetition that will be, ne be needed in the coaching process. Now, you might be asking yourself, where do I get this from? And I would like to say that when I first started language coaching, there really wasn't any research done in that. Uh, and we were operating from the corporate perspective of how we really did that. Uh, and and I, I used that experience as an HR manager. Uh, but, you know, in 1993, uh, uh, Anders Ericsson did research that he had been doing for a long time, and he was able to really define that, uh, and he defined language coaching as really deliberate practice. Uh, and I still, to this day, still use the framework set out by uh, Anders Ericsson uh, in the deliberate practice a publication that came out that was first a paper. He wrote many books about it. There's been many books written about deliberate practice. Please go to YouTube. Uh, you can Google this, find all the wonderful interviews uh, with Anders Ericsson about deliberate practice. And yes, he does mention language learning, uh, language training, and how all of that can be used and how deliberate practice can be used to help our learners reach their personal goals. Well, he does point out that, you know, it's feedback and it, it must be there continuously. He does say that it is a very mentally highly demanding process and that sometimes because of the repetition, it's not always fun, but the coaches know that it has to be done for their self-improvement. Uh, and it's also designed to improve their, you know, that de uh, um, uh, deliberate practice is there uh, because our coaches want to improve their performance. Again, the key word there is repetition. It's going to be repeated again and again. Look at the bottom there where you will be able to Google this document uh, that he published in 1993, which set the gold standards for what we know today as language coaching. My last words here are language coaching is deliberate practice in action uh, and deliberate practice requires performance, assessment, feedback loops, improvement and repetition. Again, I quote uh, the gold standard put out by Professor uh, Anders, uh, Anders Ericsson, who was a Swedish psychologist and professor of psychology at Florida State University. Uh, and who is to this day, now he recently passed a year ago, uh, and, but he is still an internationally recognized researcher in the psychological nature of expertise, human performance, and language coaching. Thank you very much. I will now stop sharing screens uh, and we'll now just go back to here. Okay, uh, and i uh, turn that over to you, Alexei. Okay, thank you so much, Ron, because uh, we're, we're now going to discuss what you have been telling about, uh, telling about uh, from the point of view of our experiences. And I'd like to ask a few question to, uh, questions to Christine Kuhn. Christine, you're a very well-known assessment specialist, and also you're very well-known for Toastmasters. So my questions will be in those two contexts. And my first mm -hmm. question is this. What is your opinion about what Ron presented? Do we as teachers unconsciously use language coaching or should we as teachers consciously insert language coaching 
as a form of assessment into the learning process. Well, thank you, Alexi, and thank you, Ron, for that informative presentation. And I have to confess that when you invited me a few weeks ago to participate in this event, I was attracted by the term language coaching, which I had really never heard before. And I'm glad you said that we probably call it a different name. So during your presentation, I've been thinking about alternative names, which I'll share with you later. But one of the things I really thought, because I'm interested in life coaching, was oh, maybe it's a little bit about life coaching. So thank you for dispelling that myth that it is not like anything like life coaching right off the bat. So in response to your question, Alexi, I'd like to talk about just one section of what Ron uh, referred to, and that's the skills that are, ne that are necessary to be a language coach. Uh, Ron, you listed 12 of those skills, and like many people in the audience, the first thing I did as you were talking us through those skills is I read through them very briefly, and I, the first one, I can't remember what it was, I thought, oh, it was something about performance, but engage in performance base. so I was saying, okay, tick, I've got that one, and I read through all 12 of those skills, and pr I pretty much had a tick in front of all the skills except storyboarding. I know what a storyboard is. I don't think I've ever engaged in storyboarding, but I'm, I'm assuming like many other lists in other parts of the field and in others, I'm assuming that uh, a language professional does not need to have, does not need to be equally uh, possessing all of those 12 skills. So I think 11 out of 12 for me I'm, I'm happy with that. And many other teachers in our audience might have been, you know, ticking off the skills that they feel they've already mastered. So how many are requisite? Um, the assumption, of course, is they don't all have to be within a teacher's realm or repertoire, but they could be focused on, teachers could focus on the development of those skills that they feel they are a bit weak in or that they feel they might need to develop in. I agree with you. The two that struck me are, of course, communication skills. And that'll go along with, I, I assume, the next question on Toastmasters. And thank you for stressing the importance of both speaking and writing, because both are important in regards to communication skills. Another skill that I think is crucially important, not just for language coaching, but for life in general, is time management. And the more I read about time management, the more I feel like it, it needs to be expanded into something like self-management as well. So those are my thoughts with regard to your, your excellent presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, now while everybody is going to think about what you, uh, what you have just said, I'd like to ask a question to Heather Hansen but I'm going to come back to you, Christine, uh, just in a few minutes. Uh, so Heather, you. on to you. You've done many videos about pronunciation coaching and your TED Talks videos are very popular on YouTube. And uh, I know that your, uh, the number of views of your videos exceeds 100,000 views uh, and sometimes more. We know that you are a global language specialist and that you are the founder of a company that operates on an international level. So what are your ideas about language coaching in comparison to what Ron has presented? Oh, thanks, Alexi. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that, Ron. Thank you for that great presentation. Um, I can really only speak from my, my perspective, which is dealing within the corporate environment. That's the only work that I do. And I can try to explain, you know, what that looks like in the corporate world, because I think Ron is right about when we're doing coaching, it's a minimum B1. Uh, my clients are at least B2, C1, almost always, because I'm dealing primarily with the higher levels of management. So when they come to me, they have the language. Uh, I've always had a bit of a problem with this whole term language coaching, because I'm still not convinced you can coach a language. I coach communication skills, I coach presentation skills, I coach articulation, very specific areas. I do not teach the language. So I'm still a little bit split on how this, how do we actually coach language skills? Uh, because I feel that that has to move over into more of a teacher role. And um, also from my perspective as a coach, 
I think it is very important what Ron said, the difference between a life coach or even an executive coach, and then someone who's focusing on communication coaching, which is what I, I would personally call myself a communication coach and not a language coach. Um, and that is that in communication coaching, we are giving feedback. We are giving um, areas of improvement. We are adding our knowledge to that. When people come to me, I am trying to bring all of their knowledge out. I'm looking at their work their own presentations, what they have to deliver, uh, the email they have to write, whatever it might be. And I'm helping them take that to the next level. And that does take input from me. It means that I have to be very quick to understand all areas of business from finance to um, organizational development, to operations, to sales, to marketing. Uh, and it's a lot more than just language. And then it's also having a lot of knowledge around cross-cultural skills and communication. I mean, I'm also speaking, remember, from a very uh, English as a lingua franca environment. I'm in Singapore. We, we cover, you know, all of Southeast Asia. People are working in the entire region. So you really need to have a good understanding of that as well. So, so the things that Ron said around, you know, the level of the coachee, um, there was also a question, I think it was uh, Paloma Garcia saying, so do we need to distinguish between students and coachees? As far as I'm concerned, everyone I work with is a client. And at times I am teaching them, at times I am coaching them, at times I am mentoring them, and I pull from that bag of tricks to use all different kinds of, of ways to engage them and help them. Um, so, so that's really what it looks like from a corporate perspective, which I can't stress it enough. It's very, very different from an English language classroom. Uh, and most of my work is also one-on-one -on -one when we're talking about the coaching. It is possible to do group coaching, uh, but primarily when I'm considering myself in a coaching role, it is very much in that one-to-one -one situation where the person has very specific goals, as Ron said, and a sense of urgency. In the corporate world, it isn't just necessarily a conference. It could be because they need to get the next promotion. They want an international posting. Their entire career is dependent on them upping their communication skills. And that's when you get the call from HR saying, fix this person, right? And anyone who follows me on LinkedIn has watched my TEDx everything. You know my feelings on that, that these people are not broken. Their English isn't broken. And it's about helping them to be understood in the world and to speak with confidence. So, so these coaching skills come in very handy in these types of situations, especially. I think if you want to work in the corporate environment, then you must be able to harness these skills when working with your clients. Heather, one of the words, uh, one of the, uh, the words that has always stayed in my mind is when I heard you use the word understandability and trying to get that because that was it changed the way I think about things because that was the now whether they said that to me or not, I realized that that was one of their goals. They wanted to be understood. Uh, and this is important that language coaching is about getting them to the point of understandability. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And when we uh, when talk uh, when we talk about understandability and uh, basically uh, how language works in our minds, uh, I think it will be uh, interesting to take a look at it from the viewpoint of an educational psychologist, and that is Andrew Hand uh, Andrew Headland. Andre, you are pretty well known across the world and you present at many conferences. So as an educational psychologist, someone who is known for cognitive and metacognitive aspects of learning, how do you feel about what Ron has presented? Uh, what is the importance of cognition and metacognition in the process of language coaching? Thank you very much, Alexei. It's again, it's such an honor to be here talking about this relevant topic with so many uh, competent pro professionals. And Ron, thank you so much for such an informative uh, presentation on what language coaching is not. That's very important for us to understand what it isn't, because I think then we can move on to what it is and it can be. So from uh, my perspective as an educational psychologist, I'd say that we do have to understand how learning takes place from a neuroscientific perspective, from a psycholo psychological perspective even. And I feel that coaching in that sense focuses much more on the learning process and not on the teaching process. Because we as teachers, and I've been working in teacher education for a very long time now, we teach teachers how to teach. We don't teach teachers how to help their students learn. 
And I feel like coaching can focus on that process as well. But I do feel that I have to say something about uh, language coaching that is probably aligned with what we are going to discuss here today, which is that um, I've, I've never worked as a coach. I've never coached anyone to, I don't know, present at a big conference or to achieve a goal that they were uh, looking after. But I did train teachers to achieve, um, to improve their careers, to actually work on their practice as educators and to understand how students learn from the cognitive sciences perspective. And I feel that we have to understand that this is really a process. It doesn't happen overnight. You have to be prepared. I'm very concerned with this wave of people who believe that they can do it very easily and they, can, they have found a magical formula that if you take a course, a 30 hour course and you get a certificate, then you can coach people and they will be successful learners. And then normally there's you know, this marketing sales pitch that it just come to me and I'll make you a, a very, uh, I'll make you improve your career or achieve your goals. And we have to be very careful about propagating those ideas because I'm really, I, I feel this is what's happening around me all the time. So that's why I like when Ron says that not everybody can be a coach. Like I, I don't think everybody can be an educator or a teacher. There's a very long process. We have to go through the hoops. You know, I, I started as a teacher at a language school and then I, I tried to get qualification. I did my master's course uh, uh, in the UK. This is the process that you have to go through. And when you understand those things and you realize that there is science behind what you are doing, that there is academic research that you can look at and reference so that you can do the things that you want to do and help whatever you call them clients or coaches and help them achieve what they want, then that makes a lot of sense. But it doesn't happen overnight. It's not easy. It should never be oversimplified. It's not something that anyone can do. There are different people who can do it, different profiles, and you have to work a lot to get to a stage that you can say, I can do this. And that's why I feel that do not think that anybody, really do not think that a person who doesn't have a degree in this or that, for example, can help you achieve something that is so complex as learning a language and performing at a very high level. You have to be careful when people sell you that idea because they're probably selling you something that doesn't work very well. All right. Thank you very much for this view because uh, many people in the chat have been also talking, saying things like, you know, that this is a marketing scheme or marketing device or something like that. So it's really interesting to see different views on this, uh, on this aspect. And uh, here is a question that I'd like to ask Svetlana. So Svetlana, you're from Moscow State University, which is one of the top universities in Russia and in the Russian speaking world. And uh, it ranks high in the world university rankings. And you train a lot of teachers, both at the university and for Learn Teach Web, which is also a great community, teachers community, international teachers community. So do you think it is important for teachers to know about language coaching, to be able to improve their teaching practice and uh, uh, to be able to improve learning for the students? What mm -hmm. is your view? Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, for your question, I would like to uh, again um, say uh, just a few words about uh, Ron's presentation. Thank you very much for giving us uh, the so-called uh, checkup list of uh, skills uh, that uh, a coach, language coach uh, should have, because uh, it's uh, very useful for language teachers. Uh, all uh, this 12, uh, which you mentioned, skills uh, are uh, of great importance. Um, I uh, just totally agree that um, FL teachers, uh, they, especially college and university teachers, I'm going to talk uh, just uh, from my experience, yeah, because I'm a university teacher, uh, they have to include into their practice some elements of coaching. Um, I believe that there are several reasons for that. Uh, the first one uh, that is of vital importance is uh, that because we teach with you uh, the generation of digital natives and uh, they are different. 
uh, they, our learners have changed a lot. Uh, they perceive information differently. Uh, they have their own learning styles. They communicate mostly online. They have their own professional interests. For example, if we speak about university students, uh, they want to learn on the go using their ubiquitous uh, different kinds of uh, gadgets and using different kinds of effective apps, online materials, and their favorite uh, just online platforms. Uh, they are ready to collaborate, but to collaborate in online educational environments. If we talk about uh, foreign language teachers uh, who usually take our online PD or CPD courses, they prefer a kind of individualized, uh, personalized uh, approach. So applying uh, language coaching, uh, I absolutely agree with Ron, uh, in teaching framework works because the focus is on the learners and the issues they face while learning or being taught. Uh, it is a kind of dialogue. It should be a dialogue. It's crucial to develop a relationship uh, with students based more on collaboration, sharing, um, partnership, uh, and balanced conversation. One more reason to support uh, coaching integration into teaching process, it helps develop learners' reflective skills and learning to learn skills. These skills, you know, are included into the 21st century uh, world skills framework developed just recently by Cambridge University Press. Some specialists say, by the way, that the roles of a teacher and a coach uh, shouldn't mix. Um, if you are coaching, uh, you cannot be teaching. <laughs> so uh, I do not, uh, as all, uh, I guess that all specialists who are present today, uh, they um, do not support this viewpoint because many uh, foreign language teachers today unconsciously uh, use activities tools, uh, different kinds of techniques to support a positive transformation in motivation, uh, personality, communication, goal setting, uh, even emotional intelligence. So it's of vital importance, as I have already said. By the way, we launched this year at Moscow State University a master degree program, which is called Foreign Language Teaching in a Corporate Sphere. ISU provides uh, this particular program, and we have included a discipline quite recently, uh, which is called Managing and Coaching in Language Education. And the person uh, who will teach this course has a kind of hands-on uh, experience in this sphere. Uh, she's the head of Cambridge University Press uh, representative in Russia. So I hope it will be a kind of success, but uh, for us, it will be kind of, you know, uh, absolutely new uh, course, absolutely new program, uh, and uh, we'll try to uh, do our best. Okay, thank you so much, because it's really interesting to learn about new disciplines, and it will be even more interesting to see the outcome, because everything that yeah. is new and that is coming into our lives uh, is definitely something worth considering. And uh, my next question is for Crystal Brody. Uh, Crystal, we know that you're a respected global leader in the field of world Englishes. You have conducted countless trainings for professionals around the world in a variety of contexts. And you are a respected leader in the International TESOL Association, including serving on the board of directors. We also know that you're a professor at a teacher's college and that you are responsible for teacher training. So what is your idea about language coaching in comparison to what Ron has presented? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for your great statements from your different perspectives. And thank you again for Skies University for putting on this event and providing the tech support and facilitating us. And thank you for to Ron for his comprehensive overview that really got us started and our attendees too. I first wanted to say in support of Ron's presentation that we cannot state enough or overstate that non-native as well as native speakers can be coaches. There oftentimes seems to be a reluctance by coaches to hire people that are non-native speakers, but Ron clearly stated you know, in his presentation, it's the, um, 
the mastery level, the competencies that should drive who can be a coach. And I wanted to reiterate that because that's also the position of TESOL that there should not be a difference between non-native and native speakers for services we provide. And um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about something that Heather said about the tool bag um, that sometimes we overlap in our tools. And um, Ron said in his presentation that coaching cannot be the same as training. I differ with that a little bit because um, I do a lot of training for coaching for my teachers. I talk about that in a second. And, um, you know, like, like I said, you know, things overlap and I do coaching principles in keynotes too. Um, so to achieve change, to achieve um, looking at things that can be improved and to set goals for, for becoming better, which are coaching principles. Um, I also want to say, in addition to Ron's points, that I hope that English coaching can take into account world Englishes, which is also the position of TESOL International. We don't want to discriminate against one English over another and one English is writer or better than another. And coaching can be done for all world Englishes depending on the purpose of who, who needs to be taught and coached and for what purpose. But again, you know, there shouldn't be a um, differentiation about that except for the purpose of the coaching. And in support of what Andre said before, bias beware. Anybody can call themselves a language coach. Recipients of coaching that pay for it should make sure to check how well the coach is trained, check references, and check if their coach is a member of one of the more respective, respected professional coaching organizations to see if they had really received the training. Um, in gen for general purposes, I want to make one last point. Um, one-on-one -on -one coaching is a service only available to those who can afford them. And clearly, it's more of a corporate um, approach. Therefore, individual coaching creates more opportunities for those who already have more opportunities and in the end creates another opportunity gap. And I would promote to use the coaching principles in group settings also um, so that um, all learners can become, uh, can benefit from uh, the coaching principles. Now, coming to my lens as a teacher trainer, um, let me explain to you whom I train. I train teachers that are in the schools, K through 12 or P through 12, who will work with their schools to help their English learners, people from other countries coming to the US, be successful in their classrooms, mastering content at the same time as they're learning English, okay? We call them English as a second language students. And my teachers are already teachers in schools and my entire program is built around the premise that my teachers need to teach the entire school, every general education teacher, every principal, every lunch lady, every front office secretary to work with these people. And you, you need to employ very strict coaching principles for that so that everybody is part um, of working towards the same goal at the end, right? And you need to do your trainings. You need to do exactly the same steps that uh, Ron outlined, you know, assessment, finding out where the gaps are, make an action plan, make a timeline, and then do the events of coaching. So my entire English as a second language training program is built on the premise to build those coaches for schools. And uh, I do this in group settings. You know, I train for coaching and um, my um, teachers have to apply these principles in schools. So, um, because not one ESL teacher can train every single student in a school that learns English, you know, so everybody needs to work towards this together and working also with the families. So my lens is very different from Heather's, you know, who looks at the more corporate clientele and I look at the masses of students in the schools, many times people with no money. So my lens is a little bit different than uh, my corporate colleagues. Thank you. Back to you. I would like to add, Crystal, to what you just said. <clears throat> I said, uh, it's important to uh, do what you said. And this is why I volunteer at a local school here uh, 
I'm a little bit older now and really want to get involved in the community. Uh, so what I do is I love working with teenagers uh, and I love going to the school. But, you know, not everybody's ready for language coaching, but I'm there to help those teenagers who, who want it and, and see a need for it. Uh, I get a lot of enjoyment from doing that. So there is a way to do language coaching with teenagers as well, too. Uh, mm -hmm. And it really helps them to develop themselves. And one, it's, I think it's one, one of the one of these uh, tenants that all of us share in this group and the people who are attendees, we all care about people. We all care about, you know, making people feel that they achieve goals. We want them to become better. And we are in a complete relationship business, you know, and I love this about this group and my profession. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to invite all of us to look at the, uh, shall I put it like this? Uh, can we look at the other side of coaching, which means that coaching is for people who, can, uh, who want intentionally and consciously to improve something, to improve themselves. And uh, my next question is for Christine. So Christine, could you tell us briefly how Toastmasters works? Because uh, you are well known for Toastmasters uh, and how the idea of people who consciously want to improve themselves uh, like, for example, the public speaking skills, how does that fit into the idea that Ron presented about language coaching and about deliberate practice? Okay, perfect question. In fact, Ron, Toastmasters is the epitome of the, the characteristic that Ron mentioned, which is central, which is deliberate practice in action. So Toastmasters is an organization that, that exists worldwide. In fact, in Dubai, there are over 100 clubs and there are both clubs that are corporate, meaning companies have clubs that are, that are only of their employees, but they're also community clubs. I've been involved in Toastmasters, oh, going on 20 years, pretty, pretty much at all levels. And most people think about Toastmasters as being an organization where they can develop public speaking and presentation skills. But it's more than that, in fact. It's more, in terms of uh, presentation skills, yes, you learn how to give formal presentations. You also learn how to do extemporaneous speaking and how to do things like tell jokes uh, successfully, uh, do different types of speeches. But a dual focus of Toastmasters is the leadership element because part of being a Toastmaster is working on the dual track of the leadership. So you serve in different roles during the meeting, you serve as you know, an officer of your club, your area, your district, even the division, even the world. So for me, and for me, I always tell people that the second best thing I've done for my own professional development over the, over the years has been my work in Toastmasters, following the Toastmaster curriculum. And in fact, it took me three years longer to get my doctorate in Toastmasters, which is called DTM, than it did to get my PhD in general. So I can't speak highly enough for uh, the development that you get through a Toastmaster club. Many of you, I hope you're thinking, hmm, I wonder if Toastmasters would be for me. Well, nowadays, all meetings are virtual. So, so you know, you can attend meetings all over the world. I recently chartered a club called Dubai Legends, Toastmasters. I'm putting the name in the chat as well as my email. If any of you want to uh, attend a meeting virtually, please email me and I'll, uh, I'll hook you up with the time and the Zoom link. Let me see if I, yeah, okay. So I'm, we're happy to have you. If you'd like to, face-to-face uh, -face meetings aren't really being held these days, but there are plenty of virtual clubs around the world and prob probably lots of face-to-face -face clubs that you can join if you're interested. You earn uh, worldwide qualifications. And again, it's a really great part of professional development for everyone. So there's the name of the club I recently chartered as well as my email. Hope to get lots of emails from you soon about attending a meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And, uh, and in particular, can I just jump so in there? And, can I just yeah, jump sure. in there and say something about what Christine just said? Because I think Toastmasters is absolutely wonderful. But you know, there mm -hmm. are other groups that we can go to to actually, in you know, for deliberate practice, and that's Pecha Kucha. 
You can sign mm-hmm. up for Pecha Kuchas all over the world and just go there and be daring, take a little bit of risk. Uh, but, you know, you can improve your language skills through Pecha Kucha organizations around the world for free. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you very much for this addition, Ron, because that's really interesting. Uh, and uh, it, it turns out that there are so many really interesting opportunities for all of us to improve ourselves, uh, to develop some skills, and uh, hence my question to Heather. So Heather, you have a huge following on social media, and you have also done a very successful TED Talk. So can you tell us about how you prepared for that TED Talk, and uh, did you use deliberate practice? I hope anybody giving a TEDx has some deliberate practice involved in that. Um, Just to build on and comment quickly on Christine's comment about Toastmasters. Um, I'm also a huge proponent of Toastmasters. I highly recommend it to all of my clients as well. Uh, It's the perfect place to learn the art of speaking. And then for anyone who wants to go to the next level to move into the profession of speaking, then there are a number of different professional associations for professional speakers that are joined together by the Global Speakers Federation. So you can try to look that up uh, in your own country. I think right now there's 17 or 18 countries that are part of the Global Speakers Federation. And that group focuses on the business of speaking. So it's also a really great place for teachers who are transitioning into the corporate environment. That's how I got my start uh, and and really went in that direction from there. So I thought I'd just throw that in. But going back to the TEDx uh, story, um, the way that TEDx is organized, if you're working with a, a a pretty professional organizer, because TEDx can vary in every location, but they're following the same standards. So if they're pretty professional in their organization, then every speaker does have a speaker coach and you will be working with a coach through the entire process. Now, I was forced to script my TEDx. I never script talks. So that was a very uncomfortable experience for me. Uh, I don't believe in scripting, so but you need to stay in your time limit, things like that. So um, there was a process of you know writing the script, having it reviewed by the coach, getting the feedback, uh, doing a lot of practice, doing delivery practice. There, were, uh, there was a live rehearsal the night before on the stage where I completely bombed being beyond all belief. I mean, I went home I, because I hate memorizing. And so, of course, I was blanking everywhere, went home, completely redid how I was thinking about it using some visualization techniques that a memory grandmaster good friend of mine gave me. I have a LinkedIn article on it. If anyone wants to check it out, I have my, my whole process there. Um, but yes, it, it does take deliberate practice. Um, and it's the same kind of system and practice that I offer all of my clients. So when they come to me, we're doing the same thing. It's okay, let's work through the content first. What's the structure? What's the framework? Uh, you know, pulling out the stories, working that in, having them deliver it over and over and over again, timing it, giving feedback. I have a very strict feedback form covering all different areas of verbal delivery, vocal delivery, language, content and structure. It has everything there. And, and they know exactly what I'm looking for. They know, they know where they need to improve. So there's that constant focus on moving forward to attain that goal. Uh, so, so yes, definitely. If you're going to do a TEDx or any kind of keynote or professional speaking anywhere in the world, a lot of deliberate practice is involved with that, for sure. All right, thank you very much for sharing your experience. And uh, some people have been remarking in the chat that they would be scared to do something of the kind. Uh, and uh, since we talk about development and about deliberate practice and how that works, uh, in so many aspects, I'd like to ask Andre a question. So, Andre, how do you see language coaching as a way to develop cognitive and non-cognitive skills in the second language? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Alexei. And and I think I didn't answer my first question properly, going back to the the idea of metacognition and cognition. And I, and I feel that we we're focusing too much on on cognition, and I, and learning goes beyond cognition. You know, it's there are emotional aspects and motivational aspects, and uh, beliefs and attitudes aspects as well as as contextual resource aspects that need to be taken into consideration. And I feel that um, if you want to become a successful coach, you have to understand certain principles of how we can motivate clients and learners as a teacher as well. So there's a in that sense, I think there's something that overlaps uh, for professionals who are dealing with 
people who want to learn something, they have to understand the underlying principles of how learning takes place from a cognitive perspective coming from neuroscience and also psychology. And when we think about metacognition, which is something that uh, I believe that all of us have learned about and we've been promoting and propagating because we understand that it really works, it brings me back to the 1970s when John Flavel talked about it and then he mentioned metacognitive knowledge and metacognitive strategies, regulation, for example, control strategies, and really understanding the things that you can apply so that you can achieve the learning goal and how you can stick to that when things go wrong, how you can adjust as you go along, right? Which is equally important, if not more important, because as you know, a, a teacher who, have been, who has been working with many students for a very long time, I feel that a lot of adult learners, they simply give up. They drop out of the course because they cannot stick to the plan. So maybe metacognitive regulation is more important than knowledge. They know what they have to do to learn, but they cannot, they don't have the skills or co competencies to stick to the plan. And that's why they never learn, or it, it takes longer, or you know they get frustrated. I've been working on a conceptual framework that is based on research because I feel that, that uh, as an educational psychologist and involved in teacher education, talking to teachers here in Brazil, trying to help them improve their practice, we have too much focus on cognition. And if you look at the definition of cognition coming from psychology, it's about attention, it's about memory, it's about language use, it's about reasoning, for example, right? So what about emotion regulation? What about self-efficacy? What about self-regulation, for example? What about different types of mindset? All of those things are equally important. And I know authors who call those things soft skills, right? We call them, uh, they are in the realm of social and emotional learning, and we don't give them as much as attention as cognition, but they are equally important. So if you want to become a successful coach, or a successful professional who deals with education and teaching and learning, you have to understand where learning happens and how it happens, at least a couple of principles, you know, the overall principles. And one of the things I've been trying to do that I think has something to do with coaching, even though I do not call myself a coach because of, you know, the back, uh, well, I, the setback I'd say here that when you think about the profession here in Brazil, in Latin America, how people are using this term, they're doing terrible things you have no idea. So really they're selling magical formulas and people buy those things because they don't know any better. So what I've been trying to do is really focusing on the motivational aspect of learning. How do you get your students to engage? We have research coming from neuroscience about the, the brain's reward system, for example, the role of dopamine. We know, for example, that people can set goals and stick to a, an action plan and become more self-efficacious. That comes from Albert Bandura, for example. We have been exposed to a lot of research coming from Carol Dweck on growth mindset, or even emotional intelligence popularized by Daniel Goleman. Those things are available, they're out there. So nobody can come and simply claim that they have created a better formula and it's exclusive that they can sell. And then if you just join them, then you're going to become a proficient learner, speaker or whatever. You know, it's out there, it's the research, it's science, it's the scientific community. We have to look at what the contributions are. They are ready for us. We just have to learn how to interpret those things and base our practice, whether you are a teacher or a coach on those things because they, they work. It's empirical evidence, you know? You have a consensus, you have people from all over the world discussing those things. And that's why I, I feel that we have Again, I have to say that over and over and over again. It doesn't happen overnight, folks. You know, there are people who have master's degrees, uh, who are, you know, who have a PhD working on those things and looking at the research. This is really one of the best things we've created as human beings, you know, the scientific method. We look at others, what they're doing, we test, we ask questions and see what works, and then we move forward, right? I'd like to add to <clears throat> what you just said, Andre, and this is sort of my mantra, you know, about this is 
experience cannot be circumnavigated. <clears throat> it's, it comes with time. It cannot be bought in a 40 hour webinar. Uh, you know, we got to work for it. Uh, it, it and uh, we, you know, sort of tweak it as we go along and learn. Uh, but eventually we will realize that, hey, I'm doing language coaching. I'm ready for it. And I know how that works. Uh, and I know how that fits into my teaching practice. Uh, you know, I say that we as language coaches need to be very aware of methodology. And I just want to add, Andre, I include metacognition in that as well, because Most if we're definitely. talking about methodologies, <laughs> we are talking about metacognition because reflection is metacognition. Okay, thank you very much for that addition, Ron, because uh, it sounds to me a little bit as if, uh, like, you know, language coaching is something that uh, an experienced language teacher will develop because it comes from experience and from uh, better understanding how, uh, how teaching works, how people think and stuff like that. Uh, so my next question is going to go to Svetlana, who deals a lot with teacher training. Uh, and uh, I'm really interested uh, in talking about uh, whether uh, information about uh, language coaching should be integrated uh, into training teachers. So Svetlana, could you please tell me whether there is anything that you do to teach teachers uh, about integrating language coaching into their teaching practice? That's the first part of my question. And the second part of my question is, how do you feel about using language coaching in the teacher training practice as a form of assessment? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alexei. Um, well, uh, first of all, yes, of course we do, but I want to emphasize the fact that we train uh, not language coach, but we train language teachers. Yeah, it's quite different. And uh, quite recently, I realized that uh, traditional uh, distance or online uh, professional development course uh, isn't uh, effective anymore. I mean, uh, even if we create, for example, an online uh, professional development course that includes some learning materials, even in the form of a short online video lectures with a test, online webinars, forum discussions, instant messaging, uh, WhatsApp, for example, or uh, any kind of uh, instant messaging uh, supporting group, it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't. Uh, so what uh, language teachers want today? They want to learn in collaboration. They want to share the experience. They want to have an opportunity to choose their own trajectory of uh, professional development. Uh, so we try to adjust uh, our courses to tailor them as it were to their needs. Uh, now we employ, um, if I may put it so, a vertical, uh, instead of a vertical kind of teaching, uh, we use a horizontal way of monitoring their learning process. To make this a bit more clear, uh, now uh, it's a kind of uh, conversation-based process, uh, the purpose of which is to figure out their goals and weaknesses, uh, then to develop the professional skills they need now and here. Uh, in this framework, the tutor or uh, teacher trainer uh, I do not call uh, him or her uh, coach, uh, and the client, they are equal partners. And this way of learning changes their mentality. I mean, the mentality of our teachers, uh, their views on teaching process. So we have a lot of feedback from our uh, teachers on that point. Um, what techniques uh, we use in uh, particular uh, questionnaires, uh, reflection practice, uh, peer tuition, self and group evaluation and assessment, interviews, Pecha Kucha discussion, which was used by Ron Moraine, uh, very popular, by the way, and we started to employ it uh, two years ago, um, practice oriented group projects, uh, etc. So, um, 
about your uh, the, the second question uh, that you asked, uh, how do I feel about using uh, language coaching in teaching uh, training process as a form of assessment? Um, I think, uh, yes, sure. I think that it uh, will work perfectly, uh, specifically in the teacher training process. Um, I doubt uh, that it will work with our students, but I'm absolutely sure that it will work with our uh, teachers. Uh, but uh, we have uh, already implemented, as I have already said, some elements. Uh, but uh, what we have to remember uh, is that language coaching uh, is an uh, approach complementing, but not pushing aside or substituting our language teaching practices. That's what we are doing. Mm -hmm. I would like to add that um, there are projects going on right now uh, in Russia, uh, but all over the world, uh, for teenagers uh, to you know prepare for TED Talks. Uh, and I thought that was very interesting when I started to look at the projects that I realized that they were actually using coaching to do it and that they were using deliberate practice. When I observed them uh, as I traveled throughout Russia, Europe and the world and to watch these programs in action, I thought, wait a minute. That's deliberate practice. So it does work with students. Um, and I do it all the time with my university students, uh, but they have to be willing to do that. They have to step up to the plate. I offer it, uh, but I never force a student to come into the coaching process. And, they, and I, again, show them the framework that I use, explain that to them and tell them what's going to happen. <laughs> because, you know, it's not always easy. And again, language coaching is not for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. It would appear uh, that we are discovering more and more sides to this issue, which seemed to be on the one hand, not so complex before we started the conference. And at the same time, we all realized that it needed some defining. Uh, so my next question is to Crystal Brody. Uh, so what is uh, your idea about language coaching as a global keynote speaker and teacher trainer and uh, to, uh, to go on top of that, what is TESOL's position on educating teachers about, about language coaching? Okay, so before I go directly to your questions, I want to um, pick up on something that Andre said and really support um, his um, point of stressing metacognitive processes. One of the problems I see in education that is that we often see these buzzwords pop up, like pulling oneself up by the bootstraps, resilience, growth mindset, mindfulness, and they are thrown against the wall like spaghetti and hoping that something will stick. But they don't usually are used with the knowledge of what to do with them metacognitively. Um, and I want to unpack them just for a second. You know, this idea of pulling oneself up by the bootstraps, resilience, growth mindset, mindfulness, is usually something that does not apply to people that come from lower financial backgrounds, lower educational backgrounds. If you don't have boots, you cannot pull yourself up by the bootstraps, you know? So there's an expectation with growth mindset and mindfulness and pulling oneself up that you have the tools to do this and you know how to do this and you have resources to do this. And in many cases, that's not the case. You know, even when I work with teachers in countries of lower economic availability, like Venezuela or Philippines, they just don't have resources. They don't know how to get trained, right? So that also means um, that a lot of the metacognitive um, processes are, you know, are very difficult to achieve with, with those teachers. and. Um, because they don't know how to approach the topic and, and get into the regulation and brain-based practices. And like Andre, I believe that there's incredible power and knowledge in knowing brain-based um, practices and capitalizing on them to build our neural pathways in the brain and make sure that actions become uh, behaviors um, and um, you know over time. So, um, you know, yay to Andre's points and I'm fully with him. 
As a keynote speaker, I approach presentations as a coach. My keynotes have to move the needle of professional practice and give my participants something new to look at, something to look back on their own practice and say, maybe I can do something different based on the keynote. It should inspire them to maybe set a goal to improve something or set a new goal for their own um, practice. And I hope with my keynotes to affect change. And I approach them as a large group, group coaching session in that um, I employ some of the principles that we have talked about. Because if a keynote doesn't make people think and um, look at things in a different way, you know, what, what's the point of having it, right? It can just be a session that people go to to learn some new skills. So coming to TESOL, uh, TESOL is, uh, understands itself as TESOL International Association, and TESOL is a term that's used by many uh, different groups, but TESOL International Association is the world authority on the quality assurance of all English teaching and learning. Um, TESOL developed the English language development standards and standards for programs and accreditation, technology standards for, teach, for learning and teaching English, and they provide, provide really the basis for coaching and what coaches should know to build the activities on. TESA also has a lot of policy standards and uh, about different groups of professionals worldwide. Uh, TESA takes into account the context, the global context and diversities of learners and teachers. And uh, anybody who's a member of TESA and using all the resources has huge, um, a treasure chest of materials and resources to start their coaching in uh, educated ways. TESA also provides a lot of training um, in all kinds of different areas. So um, if somebody wants to be coached, they can uh, learn coaching, they can get a lot of training by TESA, leadership certificates and other um, trainings online that they can build their, their own tool chest of skills. So, um, you know, I, I'm always a little bit troubled when I go to countries. And one time I, I did an accreditation visit in Peru at, a, at several schools and they did not follow any professional standards of any sort. And everybody made up their own standards and their own definitions. And I was troubled by that. You know, I think that we should have some professional standing and some understanding of what the basic tenets of good teaching and learning are and including our brain-based practices. So in my world of teacher training, I teach teachers to coach their colleagues on how to train their language learning students. And their job is all about relationships with their peers, convincing school personnel that they must improve something and commit to doing so. And then work with each group and individual teacher on how to reach their goal of supporting their students in their classrooms in their situation. So my, my trainees must be first perceived as partners. They cannot come with a power deficit of higher to lower. You know, they need to be equal with the teacher so they even hear them. And they need to be seen as somebody who acknowledges what they know and can give them something to do that job better. And they need to use data, use technology effectively to share materials and training when time is an issue. And of course, you know, uh, they need to encourage practices of resilience, growth mindset, mindfulness by using metacognitive um, principles. And so um, it's a very complex, multi layered process that's very complicated and, um, you know, it involves a lot of different steps. So back to you. Okay, thank you so much for uh, thank you so much for telling us about uh, for telling us about these things, uh, because it's really important to see as many different views of the issue uh, as we can. And now I have a few quick questions because we are uh, getting close to the time limit of the conference. Uh, well, it's not really a very strict limit, so we uh, we're, we still have time. Uh, but let's take a look at uh, at the uh, practical side of these things. Uh, so my next question is to Christine. So Christine, you are a teacher and you work at a university. Uh, so uh, could you please tell us whether you do any language coaching with your students? And if yes, how do you do it? Uh, well, 
And I'm going to circle back to what many of the panelists have already said today and some of what some of the questions have been as well. Can we teach a language class, but also coach within the same class? And I've been thinking about this throughout most of the session. And I'm going to take a stand and say, yes, we can, because I feel I do it. And I think the key is the motivation. Ron showed a framework where motivation was the central element. And there were a lot of other things. And I'm thinking, I regularly teach, I've been teaching online for the past 17 months, and I regularly teach groups of students where some are motivated and engaged. And, and those students I use language coaching with, but in many, many of the other students, I suspect because here in Dubai, no one turns their cameras on when they're in class for some strange reason, although I'm discovering that that exists in other parts of the world. So I suspect that many of my students kind of log on to the class because that's how they get attendance and they go back to whatever they're doing, whether that be sleeping or playing video games or whatever. So, um, I feel that yes, it is possible to be doing language teaching with some, but extending that into a coaching uh, process with others right in the same classroom. Don't know what an, everybody else has to say about this. So as far as how do we do this? Well, I think if we look at those five uh, characteristics that, that Ron mentioned of a language coach, beginning with doing things that are performance-based or task-based teaching and learning, and then uh, using ass assessment practices that have immediate feedback loops with a focus on uh, improvement and repetition all the time to you know, extend those skills or to reinforce those skills. I think those are the steps to using that at any level, not just higher education. Over to you, Alexi. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to hear people from different continents, from different backgrounds, uh, but uh, from very, very high professional level and to compare our ideas and experience. So my next question goes to Heather Hansen. So Han uh, Heather, since you're a language specialist, do you do language coaching with your clients? And if yes, how do you do it? Yeah, as I said earlier, I would classify what I do more as communication coaching than language coaching. But to answer the question of how I go about that process, it starts in the very, very first conversation. And one thing that we haven't talked about here, but Ron alluded to when he said, you know, it's not the same as life coaching. It's in that very first consultation, making sure that it's the right fit. So some people say, oh, I really want to improve my sales presentations. Well, okay, yes, it's communication, but I know sales trainers who would be much better fit for you. Let me pass you to a sales coach or a sales trainer, some kind of sales program. I have people come to me because I do a lot with articulation and pronunciation for international intelligibility. And they come to me and they say, I really want my voice to be deeper. They want a voice coach. That's different from what I do. And I think that's the first thing. If you're going to call yourself whatever you're going to call yourself, you better be true to that in what you're delivering. And you have to be able to say no. Uh, I think this is one of the, the hardest and worst things I see in our industry is that teachers uh, are, are so desperate for the business. You have to understand we're in a over $63 billion business <laughs> internationally. This pie is huge. You could have the tiniest little sliver of that pie and you can still make more money than you'll ever need in your life, uh, you know, depending on who you're working with, how you're doing it, how you've built your business. Um, but you have to be able to know who is the right fit for you and know when to say no. No, that is outside of my lane. This is my lane. So it starts in that very, very first conversation with me. I'm already using coaching techniques to ask them questions to really get to the bottom of what is it they really want. Um, and uh, I've actually, for anyone who's interested, get in touch with me privately. I've written an article on this for um, Speak Out, which is the pr pronunciation special interest group for Aya Tuffle, all around um, figuring out what the real needs are for students who come to you and say, I want to sound like a native speaker. And I've, I've said to so many people, you know, the problem is not in your mouth, it's in your mind, because you have been... Um, 
indoctrinated to believe so many things about the English language and what success means in English that you have been led to believe you need certain things when really all you really want, they want belonging, they want respect uh, for their ideas, they want to feel like they have been heard. And yes, communication skills and language are a big part of that. So that coaching relationship begins in the first conversation. And I have to know that we're a fit. And then from there, we have a, I have a full speech assessment that I do with every one of my clients, depending on what their needs are. If it's pronunciation, it's a full pronunciation review. If it's public speaking we're focused on, then I have them send me videos and everything else. I do full assessments. So we have a baseline. We do final evaluations to do a comparison and have we met the goals? Where are we in the process? Um, and of course, touch points in between. And then each session, when they come to me, they're bringing their work material that we are working through and they're getting continuous feedback uh, and further assessment and suggestions for improvement and practice. The time with me is for practice. So if I am going to have them look at any grammar points or any pronunciation review, that's done in their own time. When they come to me, it is about speaking and practicing and receiving feedback. And that's much more of what the coaching process is. I'm not teaching during that time. I'm not delivering the theory and the instruction. I'm helping to give them the feedback and the sounding board uh, so that they can take their performance to the next level. So uh, that's in a nutshell what I do. Um, so yeah, that's that's it. Hopefully that's helpful. Uh, Ron, Ology there is needs analysis, okay? Because we do do a needs analysis uh, and we do do a diagnostic assessment. Again, I will just, you know, support what you just said because I do require my students to send me a video of mm -hmm. them already. I want to see that before I sit down with them. I need some ideas of where are they at. I don't like to give them grammar tests or anything like that because, you know, it's not about language, but I do need to see their language level. So the requirements to come to one of my coaching sessions for any of my students uh, and before I, you know, ag agree to that is they've, you know, have had to uh, do a, you know, I've done a diagnostic language assessment with them. Uh, I've done a needs analysis. They have to fill out a formula, a form uh, and send it to me. I want to know why they want to do that, but I also need a video. And that always happens before the coaching session. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a good point. It's not, I, I also, I've never given a grammar assessment. I have them send me um, emails, real emails, slide decks that they have written, and I review and find where they are and their level based on that. So everything is very much related to their real work uh, and how we can improve it. Yeah, but it, that's, it's just so important having all of that baseline to, to know where you're going with them and what they need. Uh, and Heather, one more thing you, you said, you know, I don't consider myself a language coach and I call myself a communication coach. And, you know, that was the term that we did use before this term became such a big thing. Uh, yeah. You know, it was on everybody's business card, you know, in the uh, late 80s and 90s, uh, mm -hmm. you know, communication trainer, communication coach, uh, and sort of the trend uh, in the EFL world was to move to language coaching because of all the marketing that was happening. But I think we are communication trainers and communication coaches in the end. Yeah, definitely. And I would say that for every level, not even only the highest levels. I think we're also doing a lot of coaching at the lower levels as well um, around the mindset and, and everything else. So yeah, absolutely. I agree, Ron. Okay, thank you so much. And now I'd like to go back to Andre. Andre, you represent an entire continent here at our conference. Uh, you live in Brazil. So could you please tell us very briefly what's going on in Latin America in terms of language coaching? Well, terrible things, Alexei, I, I must say, I must confess, actually. I mean, there are some good coaches, I know them, but I think people do believe in this idea that they can uh, become an overnight success. And it's so appealing that people are following the wrong people, I'd say. And so you have a lot of people who have invested quite a lot of money into becoming um, somebody who can deal with marketing, basically. You know, they, they can market themselves in such a, 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 an attractive way, appealing way that people just follow them. And they realize that those people, they don't really have the qualification. And this is something that I'm very concerned with. I'm, I'm actually a board member of the Brasti, so Mind Brain Education Special Interest Group here. 
And I, I don't like uh, what people are talking about neuroscience and psychology being used to transform how you can perform in, in a way, because it's not overnight. It's a process, like I said. So uh, I'm not so familiar with what's going on in all of Latin America. I've, I've followed a couple of people, but I know that some people, they claim that they can make someone learn English in a couple of weeks or three months or eight months. or And this is incredibly popular here. And it's it's scary, actually, because you have, and those people that have millions of followers on social media, and they have live sessions every Friday, and it, they attract more and more followers. So the people who are doing, you know, the, the actual good job, the, the good work that they have qualified themselves to, to be able to do that, they don't get as much attention because they don't know how to sell themselves. It's about marketing again. And uh, this is something that I think we don't talk enough because there's a certain, I don't know, I think people get a little apprehensive that they might, uh, uh, I don't know, hurt someone or they might have conflict. But I think we have to address this because this is really a lot of adult learners who have had very unsuccessful experiences as you know, uh, learners of English in Brazil, they fall for those, uh, you know, marketing scams, I'd say. And this is very problematic because you've tried your whole life to learn English at a language center, for example. And you know that if you get started, if you start as an A1 student and you go up to C2 and you, you do everything that you have to do, you're probably going to be a successful learner. But then people believe that they can do it faster and in a more effective way because they fall for those scams. And unfortunately, I, I feel like one of my main uh, jobs nowadays as a board member of the Mind Brain Education SIG is to alert people, be careful. It doesn't happen like that. You have to trust the people you're working with. You have to hire people who know what they, they, they are doing. You have to hire people who have you know, they understand methodology, like Ron said, right? They, they have the experience there. And like Heather said, you know, you have to be able to say no, if that's not what you do and refer them to somebody who does that, because it's a huge market. And I feel like those people are more and more just making promises that they cannot hold because they're just trying to sell. This is really, really complicated. And, and I feel like we have to address this issue more often especially in conferences and, you know, especially here for, for learners who don't have good references. They don't know who to go to. So we have to talk about the uh, possibilities that they have, you know, the, the opportunities there that are out there, and especially how do you hire someone to help you achieve your professional goals? What are the criteria you're looking for? And don't fall for very quick, you know, easy, quick fixes, they probably don't exist, you know? <laughs> I mean, everything is really a process, right? So we have to be careful with those things. Okay, thank you so much. And it's really, really important to understand what, you, uh, what to expect when you think about a particular method, methodology, uh, language teaching, language coaching and stuff like that, because it is true that sometimes people have really unrealistic expectations. Uh, so I'd like to ask Svetlana a question. So Svetlana, could you please tell very quickly, uh, do you ever get teachers who ask you about language coaching? And if yes, what do you tell them? Yes, uh, thank you very much. But uh, they ask not about uh, language coaching, but uh, usually they ask uh, about the difference. So what is the difference between language coaching and language teaching? Uh, I think that uh, Ron highlighted uh, very conclusively in his presentation the difference between uh, what is language coaching and what is language teaching. I'm not going to dwell on that. But uh, I usually uh, tell them that coaching is never to be confused with psychology or counseling. It's a kind of uh, guidance and support of our students' uh, goals. And uh, it helps to boost our students' motivation, as Christine said. Absolutely. Uh, and um, let me emphasize one more uh, 
just time, the fact that uh, language coaching will not be effective on its own. It supports uh, teaching learning process. It doesn't substitute it. It supports. That's important to understand. For example, coaching can be used before a language uh, course, after assessment of uh, group members uh, in form of interviews, questionnaires, checkup list, reflections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The aim is to strengthen uh, the efficiency of courses and to create the foundation of a learning framework with a higher success rate. That's the main aim. Coaching can be used to support the ongoing learning process for groups or individuals uh, if students uh, have some difficulties or if they got stuck, as it were. Uh, it helps students uh, create new focuses and it helps uh, teachers to uh, provide new opportunities for learners. But uh, if we talk about Russia, for example, about Russian context, I'm absolutely sure that it works well in two spheres. Sphere number one, corporate sphere. Sphere, uh, sphere number two, academic sphere. But, uh, of course, when we talk about schools, uh, when uh, we talk about preschooling, unfortunately, <laughs> it doesn't work. Uh, uh, when we talk about additional education uh, courses, uh, it might work, but I, I'm absolutely sure that it works well today uh, in corporate sphere and uh, in academic sphere in Russia. Thank you. I want to add, uh, Svetlana, that the one thing that brought me to Russia and me flying to Moscow all the time before I actually met Alexei and all the other colleagues that I have in Russia was that I was working for an international company who flew me to Moscow all the time just for language coaching. Uh, so yeah, I was very aware that it was happening even in Russia at the corporate level. Uh, my goal was to bring that to Russian teachers and let them see that that was a great opportunity for them to add to their teaching practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Svetlana. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, and uh, while we were looking at language coaching from so many different aspects, uh, there was one thing that I thought we really missed. We talked about the role of the coach. We talked about what the coach should be able to do. We talked about the students or the coaches' perceptions uh, of language coaching and stuff like that. But there was one question which kept nagging me all the while. And... Uh, I'd like to address that question, but I'd like to, uh, I'd like to say that uh, I'm going to step down from my role of the conference moderator for a while, and I'd like to switch to a slightly different role. The thing is that I'd like to speak as a materials developer and a publisher. I work as academic director uh, at SkyS for universities and also as the editor-in-chief at Tittle Publishers, which is a Russian ALT publishing company. So all the while, while I was listening to the presentations and to the ideas, I thought that, is there anything that materials developers need to do to make their materials suitable for language coaching? Uh, and to put it in the more general terms, is there any difference in teaching materials for language coaching and for the teaching as we know it, for the more traditional things. So I'd like to show you a quick presentation. Uh, it is really a very short one. Uh, and my presentation is uh, about teaching materials. I'd like to take a very quick look at, uh, at these things. Uh, so I looked at the International Language Coaching Association and about what they say about language coaching. And I've tried to put the, uh, the main points uh, on the slides, on the following slides, uh, while all the while, uh, all the while trying to think of how that can influence uh, teaching materials. So here are some of the goals of language coaching as listed by the International Language Coaching uh, Association company. Uh, so one of the goals is to let the coach reach their individual goals. Uh, in my view, uh, these things include passing the exams, I mean the goals. Uh, when we talk about university students, uh, because very often there is a clear distinction, like, you know, that uh, 
language coaching is opposed to teaching because teaching is curriculum oriented and language coaching is individual oriented. But I think that when we talk about university students, one of the goals is to pass the exams. So being curriculum oriented is important for them. So learning for a university students has to be curriculum oriented. The next goal uh, is to make targeted improvement in highly specific areas. And I think this brings us to a need for extra materials in, speci in those specific areas uh, developed based on the student's goals, naturally. Uh, the next goal is to ensure learning takes place outside the classroom too. But then again, if you look at it from the point of view of materials, then there is a need for project work and for self-study materials to take the learning outside the classroom, especially if you are not in the target language environment. If you live in a country, uh, like for example, we do in Russia, where we uh, all speak a very, very different language on a daily basis, I mean, different than English. Uh, the next point, uh, the next goal is to help the coach use various learning strategies. But then again, there is a need to explain strategies in the materials and the final goal is to keep up the coach's motivation. And that means that materials need to help build motivation. Let me show you some examples, because when we talk about theory only, uh, a theory never works unless it is supported by materials. But let us consider whether the materials that already exist are suitable for language coaching purposes as well as for teaching, or whether there is any, need, uh, any big difference. Uh, I'm going to present a few of the materials that we have at SkyS for Universities, uh, and uh, Kirill, my colleague at the end, will tell you how you can get free access to them if you want to. Uh, so SkyS for Universities has core courses for university students. And these courses are specially written courses and textbooks, uh, ranging from general English courses to professional English. Uh, you see a number of them uh, on the slide. Uh, and these courses are assigned to students according to the curriculum. So the students do not get to choose them. They're, they are assigned according to the curriculum that university, uh, uh, university teaching is based on. But there is a huge resource book, uh, resource bank, sorry, and self-study materials. Like, you know, we have vocabulary trainers, grammar trainers, pronunciation trainers, self-study courses, like, you know, for example, courses on how to get internships, uh, courses on some business aspects. Uh, courses on how to do presentations and some of the other aspects that have been mentioned today. And those courses can be chosen by the student and they can be done as self-study materials. Uh, we also have a progress monitoring system and you can try that out if you want to. And that means that each exercise, each skill and each course and each student uh, are monitored and they can make very well informed choices because they see how well they're doing, whether they're doing better than they used to, uh, how well they're building up skills. Everything is there for them. Everything is accessible so that they can make their choices and decide, like, for example, they do some, uh, they do want to do some extra vocabulary practice or grammar training, but the materials are still there. While providing the choice, there is no big difference in the materials themselves, as I believe. And of course, there are projects and there are self-study courses and there are some learning strategies within those textbooks and courses. And that's something you can take a look at. Uh, like, for example, here are some examples of SkyS materials. I'm not going to go any deeper, but you see that we have interactive exercises for self-study. We have videos, we have trainers and stuff like that. And everything is accessible to you. And I would be really, really, really grateful to all who are listening to us uh, if uh, you use any of those materials. And if you let me know afterwards, I will be happy to share my email address and everything, uh, whether you find them suitable, whether you'd like to keep using those free materials and stuff like that. Uh, so how do they, uh, these materials work on the platform? Because it is also important to understand that. Uh, let me show you a two minute video, which is a very, very short one. And then we'll move on to uh, summing up and rounding up the conference. So just a second, I'm going to show it very quickly so that you get a better idea. Just a moment. Welcome to Sky Higher Ed. In this video, we'll tell you what Sky's Digital is and for what purposes you can use its services. Sky's Digital is an online platform for teaching English in higher institutions. Wherever you are, everything you need for teaching is already in your computer. Your personal area. List of all groups and students educational courses for teaching English for different levels and purposes, 
for internships, job interviews, IT, management, and much more. Library of video resources and interactive tasks. All tasks are done on the platform. All you need is just a laptop, a tablet, or a smartphone with internet connection. The platform checks the work of each student and of a group as a whole. All tasks are checked automatically and you can see results immediately. You can monitor students' progress in your personal area. Points for completed tasks. Mistakes made. Dynamics of language skills. Based on these data, you can develop an individual learning plan for each student. Use Sky's digital services and your students will definitely reach their goals. Sincerely yours, Sky's digital team. Uh, okay, that was basically all that I wanted to share with you. And I wanted to uh, uh, all of you to really think about whether there is any significant difference uh, in teaching materials for the teaching purposes or uh, for language coaching purposes. Because to me, it seems that uh, really, it is not so much the difference in the purpose, uh, like, like uh, sorry, uh, it is not so much uh, the difference in the content uh, and the way the materials are organized, but rather for what purposes we use them. Uh, so uh, that was uh, Alexi, very, can, I yep. can I jump in there and say, because uh, sure. we had had this conversation maybe a two years ago, uh, but you know, I use language coaching for exam oriented courses. It is one of the most effective ways to really, you know, get people to improve their writing, improve their speaking scores. And I actually did a five year study because I was, uh, you know, had a language, you know, testing center on the statistics of the groups that didn't use language coaching to improve their writing and speaking scores and the groups that did. And it was amazing the difference in the scores. So language coaching can be used for exam oriented learning as well. And I think that moves us on to uh, Crystal because Crystal, we forgot to get you to make your last comment there and we wanna make sure you're getting in there. Uh, so what would, we're gonna start with Crystal and uh, Crystal, sort of, you know, your last comments there, anything you wanna say about today's conference and last words that you wanna leave us with. Well, thank you. Um, I, I like that we unpacked coaching from so many different perspectives. And I really like to read the comments of our participants, you know, the questions they had, because it shows the intricacy of what we're working with, right? And I think the, there's a problem with not knowing exactly what coaching is and what it should be and being able to define it, but it also is an opportunity to make coaching something great. And um, I just want to acknowledge that the possibilities for the entire world, for all economic backgrounds, not just corporate, to um, experience coaching of the highest quality and the principles of coaching so everybody can reach their goal. Even people like me, where I failed English in eighth grade and had to repeat my school year, and here I am talking to you in English, you know, um, it is possible with the right teachers and the right mindset. And from my personal experience, I know that mindset and mental, the mental status are everything. You know, if we as coaches or teachers establish that relationship with the students that they want to learn and think they can learn, then coaching can, for, can fertilize that ground and we can achieve that goal. From my own personal experience and as a teacher, I learned that. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, basically, we are going to wrap up our conference. There are only a few minutes left. So I'm going to ask uh, each of the speakers uh, in turn the same question. Uh, so my next, uh, my question goes to Svetlana. So Svetlana, what is your takeaway from what has been talked about today? And what message would you send teachers about language coaching? Ah, sorry, I disappeared. Um, well, um, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It was really very interesting, uh, insightful, and uh, provoking a lot of um, 
I would say, thoughts. Uh, I think that uh, what I would like to say uh, is that many fundamental approaches today uh, to language teaching are based on the theories and practices with the teacher as the only source of knowledge, a model and provider of uh, just information and feedback, unfortunately. And this doesn't go well with our students. We know about that. Uh, who uses uh, who uh, used to the so-called independent decision making and control in their own learning curricula and syllabus and the so-called cover to cover textbook syndrome crippling the process of language learning that is born from the need to standardize you know that we all uh, i mean academic sphere schools universities colleges uh, in any country in the world, uh, they live and work under the so-called uh, academic standards. And uh, But uh, on the other side, I'm absolutely sure that a professional teacher today should be able to fulfill several roles, be a linguist, uh, be a successful psychologist, a coach, a moderator, and an artist to a certain extent to be successful in his or her professional life. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So I'd like to address the same question to Andre. Andre, what is your takeaway from what has been talked about today and what message would you send teachers about language coaching? I guess I would tell people that if they want to learn English, look for a teacher so that you can learn English. And if you want to perform at, I don't know, maybe a conference at a higher level, then you can get yourself a coach. And this coach will have the tool that you already, already have in you, English, to help you achieve that goal. And don't buy anything, really. Um, and look at the qualifications of the professional you're hiring Make sure you choose somebody who's ethical. Uh, uh, you know, as Heather has mentioned, I think this is very important because sometimes it's really about selling. It's about a sales pitch, really. And you want somebody who has lots of experience, who has done, you know, uh, the proper qualifications, who has their methodology, who understands how learning takes place, who who understands a couple of principles about the brain and the mind. And then, of course, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're going to be successful as long as you want to, you know, and you, you're willing to do the things that are necessary for you to get there. So that's my message. Okay, thank you very much, Andre. Uh, so the same question goes to Heather. So Heather, what is your takeaway and what would you say, uh, what, what message would you take to teachers about language coaching? Well, I have found this so incredibly interesting and insightful hearing from everyone all over the world tonight. It is tonight for me, and maybe this afternoon for many of you, <laughs> or this morning. Um, but, but what an amazing time to be in our industry. There is so much change happening there with technology, with globalization, with the way that we look at the language, with advancements and understanding around linguistic bias. Uh, there is so much happening in our field right now. And I think the one thing that I know 100% certain is that if you want to be successful and move forward in this field, having coaching skills is going to be a must. You need to know how to niche in our industry. You need to know how to brand yourself. Uh, the importance of marketing is, of course, there. Do it ethically. Uh, but knowing what you are here to contribute to our industry and and yeah, what, what is it that you offer that's different from everyone else? That, that's just so important to understand. And I think no matter what, no matter what you think about these ideas around coaching, these are skills that we are going to need moving forward because pretty soon technology is going to replace a lot of what we're doing. Uh, and if you don't have these, these special more niche skills, I, I do believe many teachers will be left behind. So keep an open mind around these concepts, learn as much as you can, uh, and and kind of secure your future in the industry that way. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, the same question goes to uh, Kristen Kuhn. So Kristen, uh, what is your takeaway from today's conference and what message would you give to teachers? 
Well, my message, Alexi, would be simple. I think we need to consider what all perspectives have been during this event, but we also need to look more directly at the materials that we used. I was really pleased with when I saw some of the topics uh, within your materials at Skies, because I, I personally believe as a tester who's very familiar with the Cambridge assessments, the IELTS, the TOEFL, uh, the ETS instruments, and I think to myself, and I know that not everything can be fun and interesting for students, unfortunately. Sometimes we've got to read things that we're not interested in, we've got to listen to things we're not interested, etc. But I think that if we really want to engage 21st century learners, we need to localize and personalize our materials. And students, in order to to kind of get them into being motivated and engaged, they need to read things that they find relative. And as Svetlana said, we need to also take advantage of the many digital platforms that students have access to that we didn't have access to when we were language learners. Uh, for me, you know, I'm a big TV watcher, a big Netflix watcher, as, all, as are all my students. So I think you just have to go with things that students are interested in and it makes the whole process more fun and more interesting for them. So I would say take advantage of everything we have uh, to our, at our disposal, including digital content. Okay, thank you so much. And I'd like to thank you in particular for mentioning the topics that Skyes University provides because uh, we, uh, we take uh, uh, we do a lot of research into those topics so that they appeared not because we thought they would be interesting, but because mm -hmm. this is what professionals told us uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of interviews that we've been doing and everything. So for those who are watching us on YouTube, if you're interested, I can, uh, I can give you a link in the chat to a few articles in English about how we do this research mm -hmm. and how we develop courses and everything uh, because we have a big team of international uh, developers. Uh, and finally, uh, Ron, what is your takeaway and what would your message to teachers be? Uh, I would like to say that um, I would like to reiterate the 12 points that I brought there, but I'm very thankful to Christine for reminding me. She goes, Ron, I ticked those off and, you know, I have all of them except one and that was storyboarding. And I would like to replace that after I listened to what everybody is saying here. I really reflected on what Crystal said. And I think I would replace storyboarding with compassion, that we should approach what we do as a teacher with compassion. So I'm going to redo that list and make sure that compassion is there, that we like what we're doing, we know what we're doing, and we do it with compassion. That's the one thing I want to say. So look at those 12 points. But I also want to say to teachers, you know, I will reiterate that again. Uh, and that is experience cannot be circumnavigated. We've got to pay our dues. We've got to do that. We've got to go out there and learn and become lifelong learners. Create a CPD little plan for yourself. Uh, go to the internet sites that I have suggested. Go to TESOL. Go to international teachers organizations that are helping you to develop yourself as a teacher and make sure that there are two things that are on your bucket list. Because if you want to be a successful and effective language coach, assessment and feedback are part of those things that you will need to bring to the table. I want to thank everyone for coming here today. Uh, this has just been wonderful. I myself am going back to rethink some of the things, but one thing won't change. Think about the skills that a language coach brings to the table and ask yourself if you have those skills before you sign up for a webinar that's going to promise you those things uh, and give you a certificate that's not worth the paper it's printed on. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Ron. And I'd like to thank everybody, all the speakers who came at different times of the day. For some, uh, for some of them, it's early morning and people are on holiday and they still found the time and went through a lot of preparation and technical uh, issues and everything. So I'd like to thank all of you so much. Uh, if there are any remarks or comments that you'd like to make, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, uh, if not, I see that 
uh, people are asking questions and they're, uh, they're asking how they can find you on social media. Uh, so uh, most of our panelists are on Facebook. It is easy to find them, just search for their names. They have a big following and a lot of very interesting things there. So feel free to find them. Uh, and now, since we are wrapping up, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to say uh, just a couple of words about our information partners. Uh, and then I will give word to my colleague Kirill, uh, who, will tell, uh, uh, who will tell about how to get certificates uh, and how to get free access to all these materials. Um, uh, so uh, these are the final slides of my presentation. Uh, if you'd like to see our materials for, our, uh, for yourselves, just go to uniskys.com and you can sign up for trial. It's absolutely free to get full access to all the materials for 30 days. Uh, and as for our uh, information partners, uh, they're also numerous. And here, uh, here you see them. Uh, one of them is Trendy English, which is a huge, huge association, group of teachers, community of teachers uh, in Russia. They do wonderful conferences. And here is the link. You will be able to download the, uh, the uh, presentation. Uh, it will be there in the conference description uh, on Monday. So you'll be able to download it, to follow the link, and to learn about Trendy English events for teachers. Uh, the, our next partner is National Association of Teachers of English in Russia. Feel free to visit their website to learn about their forthcoming events. They're absolutely free and they're absolutely great. Uh, the next one is uh, of interest to teachers who work in Russia. Uh, it, uh, the organization is called Obersoyuz Educational Union, and they're providing grants for teachers up to 1 million rubles. Uh, they offer grants. Uh, you, you can file an application, you can apply for a grant until the 10th of August. Do not miss your chance. This is a very nice sum. And finally, Teachers Teach Teachers. That's a wonderful group of teachers, several thousand of them, who hold masterclasses and workshops to teach each other about language, to coach each other, and to share best practices. Okay, so I'd like to thank all of you. Uh, I'd love to thank the speakers for speaking. I'd love to thank the listeners for listening. Uh, this, uh, we are wrapping up the conference, and now I'd like to give word to my colleague Kirill, who is going to tell you how to get the certificates. All right, that was great. Uh, we want to thank all of the speakers and all participants of our conference, and as we promised, we are going to give out one month trial access to our platform along with the certificate of participation. And uh, this is how you can get those. Let me share my screen. Okay. So the first thing you should do is to go to our website, which is uniskys.com. I believe you can click the link in the chat or you can access the website in the description of our video. Uh, then you go to register. All right, so, so far, so good. This is easy. You go and press teacher. And you do not need an invitation code. You go down below to try a free demo account. All right. And this is a very uh, familiar process to all of us. So you just fill in your email and the password. After this, you will have your access to your personal space at uniskies.com. Let me show you. So just sign in. Of course, I already have my login information here. Okay. And as simple as that, this is your personal space in our platform Unisky S and you can use it for free for the whole month with the full access to all the material and courses. As for uh, the certificate of participation, you go down to SkyS conference, click on get your certificate of attendance and get your certificate here. It will redirect you to the page where you can fill in all the necessary information, which is your name. i let it load for a second. Okay, here we go, which is your, um, first of all, conference title 
what is language coaching okay then your name which is Kirill okay even my surname and the last but not the least your email after you submit the request you will receive the information within uh, a week time I believe or maybe even uh, less so this is a very straightforward process and very easy to do so please go to uniskis.com and uh, once again uh, thank you for your time and your questions we appreciate your curiosity and involvement in discussions thank uh, thanks to all the wonderful speakers and uh, to our host alexei and we're constantly working on bringing you the best of academic world and stay tuned and see you at the next skys conference thank you <laughs> okay thank you so much okay. and now we're going to take a group photo uh, of all the speakers Do we, do we need to count like one, two, three, or everyone has their own smoke? Cheese! <laughs> cheese. <laughs> okay, let, let me count if you don't mind. One, two, Did three. I keep cheese. smiling. Yeah. All right. Excellent. All right. I got, I got.